Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone listening out there across the planet Earth. Welcome to a brand new Vestiges After Dark. And I am your host, Bishop Brian Willett, coming to you live from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains on this June 15th, 2021. And I can't tell you how excited I am tonight for this show. Uh, We have a very, very special guest, Dr. Michael Grosso, philosopher, uh, writer, a brilliant mind, Um, somebody that I discovered actually quite recently and uh, was very excited when he agreed to come on the show tonight to talk about reality, our perceptions of reality, the paranormal, and how it relates to consciousness. This is right up everyone's alley. I know all of you out there love this kind of conversation, so we've got two hours of it tonight. Don't go away. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight on this edition of Vestiges After Dark. As always, I hope you are having a wonderful evening or afternoon or morning. I know we have people listening from all over the world, and we appreciate all of you for coming and tuning in to uh, the various topics that we bring to you on this show uh, almost every Tuesday evening, uh, at least in Eastern time. Um, And, you know, tonight is no exception Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, depth of conversation that we've had over the past several uh, episodes. I mean, it's been really a good season. I think it's been the best season that this, uh, the the podcasting uh, has uh, has ever had in terms of, you know, all of the various uh, things that we've offered through the Nicolaian uh, channel. And, uh, you know, this is going to be such an interesting show tonight. Um, I don't even want to really waste much time talking and giving announcements. Uh, There weren't really any big things to discuss anyway, other than to just remind you all that we're still continuing on our 3 p.m. demand to the cosmos that uh, COVID-19 go away. All right. So make sure that you're still doing that. It's 3 p.m. Eastern time. So whatever time zone you're in, um, use the power of your consciousness to effectuate this. You don't have to be a religious person. This is not a religious show, even though we sometimes talk about religion. Um, and even though I'm a bishop, when I'm in this role, I am just uh, another person <laughs> giving you insights into the profound topics that we all like talking about here, whether it be the paranormal, the esoteric, the metaphysical, uh, you name it, the occult. Uh, we cover it on this show, and um, we're just very, very grateful for all of you who have made this show possible. And, uh, you know, make sure you get the word out. Uh, retweet it if you're on Twitter. You know, post about it on Facebook, all of the various social media. Let people know um, that Vestiges After Dark is out there. It's back, and um, we're trying to be more consistent with it. Okay, so um, that's that's all we need from you. Just make sure that you get the word out and, uh, you know, we'll continue to bring this excellent programming to you. Um, you know, we've got Sister Mary Joan here tonight. How are you doing, Sister? Good evening, everyone. I hope you've got your thinking caps on. Yes, we've got... You're going to uh, need them tonight. You're going to need them tonight, yeah. Not that you don't, you know, not that, that you don't always need them on this show, but, you know, sometimes it's a... You know, know, there's different layers of depth, and and we're going really deep tonight, down the rabbit hole. We are going really deep tonight, yes, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, And for those of you out there uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, 
wanting to call into the show. We'll do that around the second half of the show. Uh, if you want to call in, I'll post the number on the screen when that time comes. Uh, you can call now, though, and get into the queue if you really want to make sure that your question is asked, although you might not know what you want to ask until you hear the first half of the show where we start up the conversation. But that number to call, write it down now, is 516-453-0138. That's 516-453-0138. And uh, that will get you into the queue. Don't hang up or you'll lose your place in the queue. And I see that every single week. People, you know, call in. They stay on hold for about two minutes and then they hang up. Um, and then we never got to them, you know. So don't let that be you. Uh, if you call in, stay on the line and, uh, you know, we'll do our best to get to you. There's usually uh, enough time to get everybody's call in. I can kind of, you know, modify the way, direction that the second half of the show goes so that we can take more calls. So, you know, call in and secure your place. OK, and if you don't feel comfortable calling in, I know a lot of you don't. Uh, that's what the chat room's for. So use the chat room on YouTube, the YouTube channel. Uh, it's open now. It's, in fact, it's open as soon as the show page shows up. So you can ask your questions, and Sister Mary Joan will be monitoring that and uh, and saving ones that seem really good to her uh, based upon the conversation we have tonight. Um, but I don't want to waste any more time. And I, like I said, I am so excited about this. I really am. Um, I, I, again, I recently uh, became aware of Dr. Michael Grosso's work. And, uh, it, you know, those of you who have followed me for a very long time know uh, where I stand on various philosophical concepts and that a lot of them, much to the detriment of my reputation, fall outside of the convention of, uh, you know, ordinary Christianity, um, or just, I guess you could say, conventional religion in general. Um, and that's because, for a reason, um, you know, I don't define myself by my religious practices. Um, you know, I, I, I maintain control of those things. They don't control me. I think the world would be a better place if we lived by that. But uh, it also opens insights. It gives you um, insights into the various aspects of reality, the, the, the nature of things that your paradigms and biases prevent you from seeing when you are owned by your religion or your worldview or your ideologies. Um, yeah, and I've, I've, I've hopefully have made some effort in my life, in this life, to move beyond that so that I can see a more accurate picture. And um, I was amazed at what I was able to discover when I started out on that path, and it led all the way up to the Forbidden Truth webinar that I that I teach. Um, but when I heard uh, our guest tonight talking uh, on another show, and um, uh, you know, started looking into some of videos on YouTube and reading a little bit about what he does, uh, I found immediately a, a similarity. Uh, there's a similarity and insight there, which I find very fascinating when this happens. It's beyond even synchronicity. We're talking about, you know, once we get rid of certain paradigms, it's like the, the reality, the, the base uh, reality of nature is revealed to us. And uh, I see that over and over again with certain people that set out to do it. And it doesn't matter which, which methodology you're using as long as it involves the, the uh, removal of paradigms. And uh, our guest tonight has written a book that kind of talks about this. And it's really fascinating. But um, I'm very excited to introduce to all of you tonight our guest, uh, who is, again, Dr. Michael Grosso. He studied classics and obtained his PhD in philosophy in Columbia University. Um, uh, he has taught philosophy and humanities at several colleges and universities. His main intellectual interest now is the study of extraordinary human experiences, creative, paranormal, and mystical, and what they may imply for human flourishing and human evolution. You can engage with him on his blog at consciousnessunbound.blogspot.com. Uh, Dr. Grosso is also an artist who, whose work is about painting the paranormal. For this, you can check uh, out his website, paintingthepsyche.com. Uh, his latest book is Smile of the Universe, Miracles in an Age of Disbelief. It's available on Amazon. I highly recommend that you go and pick it up. Um, and our discussion today, tonight, will be, be to focus on uh, supernormal human experiences and what they might 
be telling us about our personal evolution. So let's uh, welcome our guest, Dr. Michael Grosso, to Vestiges After Dark. Hello, uh, Dr. Grosso. So nice to have you here with us tonight. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet uh, with you because I uh, really get uh, a sense of uh, another philosopher uh, ready to share uh, oh, yeah. my interest. And uh, I grew up in a, in a, at Columbia University, and I learned that the moment I talked about the paranormal or anything that deviated from the mainstream reductive materialism, that uh, they looked at me as though I was crazy, <laughs> but uh, that, that's beginning to change now. Of course, I, I I I managed to graduate quite a while ago, so yeah, I don't have to worry about that anymore. But uh, pleasure to meet you. Yes, yes, same here, same here, and it is definitely our uh, I'm honored to have you on this show. I really am, and y you are correct. Uh, you are in good company. Um, I have spent the greater part of my life. Uh, studying philosophy at the detriment of again reputation and 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 status and all of those good things that people focus so much attention on, um, it's worked out for me um, strangely enough. But I think the universe kind of has a way of doing that when you completely surrender your control and and uh, let you know it take you where uh, you're meant to be, whether that concept is God or or some higher force or spirit. Um, it really doesn't matter to me what we call it, other than the fact that those mm -hmm. of us who have experienced it know it exists. Well said. Exactly. Uh, I think you're right about the naming. We have different names that can turn people off. Uh, there are some people that if you use the word paranormal, they get all uh, upset. If we use the word religion, uh, I have the problem with the word miracle. People immediately... Uh, understand uh, that I'm talking about something religious, and it's not necessarily so. Yeah. Because uh, what I mean by miracle is something uh, more universal uh, than just uh, strange phenomena that are presumably the result of divine intervention. They may be. I don't know about that. <laughs> but it's there's a wide range involved in the concept of miracle uh, that should be open to everybody. I agree. And I think that that is, you know, semantics is so important. One of the first things I do with my students when we discuss esoteric topics is I, you know, spend an entire unit, which takes several months, just getting them to unlearn our common usage of certain terms and to give them a new vocabulary that is consistent with the material that we will study going forward. Uh, and it's not that, mm -hmm. you know, my my definitions are better than anyone else's, but when we are working together as a group with, you know, teacher and student, uh, I find it's important to always be meaning the same thing when you say something. And yes, miracle, it implies, I guess, to the common perception, a religious experience when it need not be so. Um, there's miracles in every aspect of of reality that you know far beyond what you know maybe the roman catholic church would consider to be one <laughs> yeah right right and your book is all about that i mean you you wrote um um a smile of the universe uh, miracles in an age of disbelief and and your book starts off with an experience you had back in 1994 uh, viewing the greek orthodox icon of saint irene uh, which was shedding tears um, would you say that that was the catalyst for your departure into the study of paranormal and miraculous oh, phenomena? No, no, that was a wonderful experience uh, to see that. And oddly enough, uh, in a church in Astoria, New York, where I was born. No, that was uh, my interest in the paranormal uh, began, uh, I would say, while I was a college student, because I had all kinds of uh, strange experiences. But actually, even earlier, I recall having uh, uh, telepathic uh, experiences at a very young age. But when I was a student in college, I had a series of uh, unusual experiences. Uh, when I was a graduate student, in fact, I, well, I couldn't sleep one night, and I um, went to another room because it was just I was feeling restless, and I drifted off, and, opened, and then I opened up my eyes, and there was my deceased grandmother 
staring at me uh, with another woman next to her also staring at me. And I didn't know who the heck they were. Yeah, I had no idea who the second woman was. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was just a pure apparition and lasted a few seconds. And so I, I then, after it ended and later on in the day, I called my mother up and told her about the dream. I said, I saw your mom last night and, and I've had an apparition of her. And there was another woman and, uh, that I didn't recognize. My mother then said, come come and visit me. We were still living in New York together at that time. Mm-hmm. So I did. My mom showed me a family photograph that I had I'd never seen her on her family side. And I immediately picked out the woman that I saw that I didn't know. She was the sister of my grandmother, whom I never met in in my life, never saw. And, uh, well, that was very impressive. Uh, I I mean, why would I suddenly have an apparition of my grandmother uh, with a stranger staring at me? It turns out it seems like a sort of a late family visit. (laughs) I don't know why it happened. It, it, it had an impact on me. So, no, I've had all kinds of experiences throughout my adult life, not frequently, but often enough to uh, indicate to me, even when I went, when I got to graduate school, by that, by that time I was surrounded pretty much by folks that were committed to a materialist worldview. And I recall telling one of my fellow students about one of my ESP experiences and he had the gall to look at me and say, but that's impossible. Uh, it would imply the falseness of materialism or something like that. I forget exactly what he said. Yeah. And I said it wasn't possible. I said I had the experience, period. And uh, so it, it was not a popular thing uh, to, to say uh, in the philosophy department back in those days at Columbia that you had seen ghosts or had – telepathic experiences and yet i did so yeah there, there's a and then i pursued it because because it was true and uh, i felt i mean it's my job as a philosopher uh to uh respect truth uh, and factual truth empirical truth and uh so i made it my duty as it were to hunt down the most provocative often and the most spectacular types of phenomena as long as as long as I emphasize this there was good evidence for them uh, and uh, that's that's what launched me into uh, a, a getting involved with other Paris parapsychologists reading the literature and, uh, and and continuing myself to have from time to time experiences that were inexplicable but I knew they were real because I was having them I like how you you describe your approach to the paranormal, you know, because it really does tend to evoke, uh, I guess you could say, concepts of of pseudoscience and and you know, particularly in paranormal investigation, where you have you know this equipment like the. SLS camera and an Ovilus 5 and there's all these things that are used in ghost hunting um, EVP collection mm. uh, you know and I think <laughs> it gets the uh, perception of being a pseudoscience to some of these materialistic um, you know personalities um, and in your introduction you you of your book you write and I'll quote this uh, this book is meant to save miracles from the dogmatic clutches of religion and science not to say that science and religion have nothing to contribute, on the contrary, but I want to return to the phenomena themselves and not be hampered by the biases of scientists and religionists. So, um, Amen to that. Yes, I like that moderate approach because I feel that, I mean, I'm not involved in science. I, I'm involved more in the religious side of the equation, but I feel it's no less important for me to maintain a sort of objective realism in everything that I do, particularly the work that I do uh, as an exorcist. Predominantly, that's the outreach of the church, and that's my primary function. Um, And uh, it's very necessary for me to be able to distinguish the difference between a legitimate event that is 
no other no other word for it than to say it's 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 paranormal and mental illness or some kind of physiological condition and we could be doing great harm if we don't make that distinction if we don't know how to recognize that distinction so i have mm -hmm. to constantly maintain my objectivity even though i think the public thinks that i don't because they see me involved in what mm -hmm. they view as pseudoscience so do you feel that the mm -hmm. human disciplines of both science and religion are distorting the reality behind paranormal experiences such as these or do you think it's something else going on? Well, the assumptions of certain religions uh, and or certain scientists, let's say, uh, or certain kinds of scientists are in conflict. I mean, with uh, freewheeling paranormal phenomena. I mean, some in some religious contexts, uh, anything that's paranormal that is explicitly not related to the religious doctrines is deemed as probably the result of a higher power, but a dark higher power, a, diabol a diabolic agency. And I'm not altogether prepared to ignore that possibility, but even if that is the case, uh, the events are, are still unusual and, and, and inexplicable and deserve to be studied. Likewise, the scientists... Uh, who are, uh, first of all, his conditioned to believe that anything paranormal or miraculous or inexplicable in terms of materialism has to be phony. And if they are that, uh, let's say, that, that area of their mental life, so rigid and so gullible, when they hear about uh, so-called miracles, I just use that word largely for rhetorical purposes. Mm -hmm. What I mean by a, a miracle is simply something that science cannot explain at this moment. Uh, but, the, but the average trained scientist, a uh, person who thinks he or she is trained in science, tend automatically to be very suspicious, but not all. I have many scientists, friends, physicists, psychologists, biologists, who are very much interested in the paranormal, just as there are religious folks uh, that are uh, deeply interested and, and receptive. So I don't think we can generalize in a, in a rigid way here about uh, how this works. Yeah. But I do think, as you suggest, we have to be alert to, to possible distortions, and we have to be careful that we ourselves are not taken in. Uh, and, uh, and it's possible, of course. I, I don't pretend that my judgment is infallible, but I do my best, and I think I'm an honest person. Uh, and uh, whereas I have encountered, on the other hand, in individuals who strike me as being dishonestly suspecting of everything without question that smacks of the paranormal. And that's, that's a different story entirely. Yeah, and and I think that that is part of the the problem. You know, there's always that dichotomy. There's always going to be the spectrum of extremism, and I think uh, there are people that are just naturally inclined to gravitate towards one extreme or the other. I think human being or human nature tends to uh, encourage moving towards an extreme, and that's where the paradigms come from. And I think we always come back in, in my work to a middle path as much as possible to maintain a moderate position as much as one can. Um, I think it's very important in religion, and I think when you really study all world religions, at least the primary ones, or maybe even some of the lesser known ones, uh, that is what it's teaching, is this middle path towards being realistic at the same time uh, open to receiving uh, information from these things that are beyond normal perception and it gets us back to mm -hmm. i think our definitions of reality and we, earlier we were talking about the semantics and how important it is i tend to define reality um according to three basic rules um and i'll, I'll give them to you here and then we can discuss this in order for something to be real OK, uh, I would say it must be one interactable by at least one observer. So at least one observer has to be able to interact with it in a way um, Two, it has to be enduring. In other words, it must be capable of existing beyond any and all observers at some point. So even though one observer might encounter it, um, the experience has to be something that can exist beyond that person. Uh, eventually, mm -hmm. at some point. 
And then the third, and I would say is the most important quality of defining reality would be um, it has to be uh, something that is shared amongst at least two independent observers. Uh, again, eventually, only in uh, and only those three conditions, uh, if they occur, would I say that something actually exists. But is it sufficient mm -hmm. enough data or is reality merely a collection of experiences in which we play out the role of an observer in order to make the experience feel objective when it really is not? And so mm -hmm. it, it gets me back to what we were just talking about there. When we are trying to apply, let's say, scientific method to an experience that, um, you know, we have miracles, but we can define miracles. And I think you have a wonderful definition there saying that it's something that science hasn't been able to explain yet, meaning maybe at some point in the future, technology or awareness will develop in such a way that they will be explainable. But at the present time, we can't. But the other mm -hmm. issue is, and this, I think, adds a very uh, almost uh, humorous, uh, ironic aspect into the mix. If the scientific method based upon making objective observation is only limited, or I should say is limited entirely to the universe in which it plays out, um, and if the universe is programmed to operate a certain way, even though the essential or actual reality that might have generated this universe might play out by completely different rules, then how can, this, how can the scientific method ever hope to share anything outside of the system in which it was programmed? The scientific method itself would be programmed according to the same rules. So let's say for a moment, like some of these theoretical physicists are arguing that um, we live in a, uh, a holographic universe or you know a matrix or some kind of uh, artificial... Mm -hmm virtual reality, some very sophisticated virtual reality. Right. Let's say that's true. Then all of the laws of physics would be literally programmed into it. And anything existing outside of the simulation would not be following those rules. So anything that science could uncover would only be what the program lets it uncover. So do you think reality is mm -hmm. operating this way? Or do you think that some of this stuff that's happening beyond normal consciousness is discoverable? Oh, for sure, the latter. I don't take this matrix talk uh, uh, seriously at all. Okay. Uh, I don't see any grounds for believing that. Uh, and my definition of reality is much simpler than yours, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, I, I, To me, whatever we experience is real. However, there are different kinds of reality. A psychotic person has real hallucinations. The hallucination is real, but it doesn't correspond to anything that anyone else has probably seen, although there are cases of uh, uh, shared hallucinations occasionally, but that's a tricky uh, question. Yeah. So I, I'm enough of an idealist. Uh, an experientialist, so to speak, to say that the beginning, the, the essence of, re of all reality is uh, simply exp our conscious experience. And we can't get out of our consciousness. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and in that sense, we can't get out of our reality unless we're in a state of dreamless sleep or after death where there is nothing after death. Then, then you're out of reality. But as long as we're conscious, we're conscious of something. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge, of course, is to see what it is, how it relates to other somethings, other people's experiences, history, what science has to say about it, what religion has to say about it. But fundamentally, the starting point of all reality for me is human experience. And in that sense, I guess I'm, I'm an empiricist in tune with a kind of William Jamesian uh, a notion of, uh, of of reality, which is perfectly okay to me, uh, from my point of view. Yeah, so. no, yeah. I mean, I think I used to say. I mean, before I developed that more complex definition of reality, I used to say reality is what affects you. <laughs> and yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and it can affect you in ways that are deceptive, good, bad, evil, destructive. But yeah, it's it's got to have some kind of a root in our consciousness. That's why you know so many philosophers nowadays, and even some science, many scientists are focusing more and more on consciousness 
because it's the one thing that we cannot deny, and it's also what I call in my book one of the one of the obvious miracles, because even the materialists, the most rabid materialists uh, nowadays, are prepared to admit that they can't explain consciousness. They they do think that one day we'll be able to figure it out. That is to say, they'll be able to reduce and explain consciousness in terms of brain processes, that is to say, physical processes. But they are no closer to doing that today than they ever have been, and frankly, I don't think they ever will. Because when you think about our conscious experience, it's intangible, it's invisible, it it has no physical problem. You can't measure it, uh, but it's absolutely real. I feel my pain, I feel my hopes, I, I remember my memories, I live in my world of consciousness, and I can share it with you through my language, but I cannot translate it into anything physical. Uh, Although, here's the interesting part about this story. My consciousness, and here we get into the topic of psychokinesis, can influence physical states of affairs, even though my consciousness cannot be reduced to or explained in terms of physical processes. That's kind of neat. And it shows, in my judgment, the primacy of consciousness in our uh, world, in our existence. Does that make any sense? It does, because, you know, we've noticed in some of our cases, you know, when we go in and investigate an alleged demonic event, um, Mm -hmm. a lot of times it's reduced down to what uh, would be, I guess, in more classic terms, considered to be a poltergeist, where you have... Mm -hmm. um, disturbances of things moving around that seem to be associated right. with one or more individuals in the household. Usually it's one. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet mm-hmm. there's nothing that we can determine would fall into the classifications that we use to uh, identify the demonic or saying that there was something malevolent there. Um, and yet they're disturbed. The family is n- naturally disturbed by the phenomenon. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, we've come in and we, try to settle that back down and what we find is it doesn't really require any kind of like you know magic shamanic uh, approach there's certainly no exorcism rituals that are necessary maybe a a house blessing but um what i find works more effective than anything is resting the person's mind that they're not being attacked by the by a demon and that seems to settle it Mm -hmm. which would indicate that it seems to be an externalization of their anxieties you know yeah Mm -hmm. So, but but in ways that are puzzling and uh, to science, though. Yeah. I mean, the oh, fact yeah. that you can externalize anxiety by causing a crockery to fly around the house—that <laughs> a shocking and fascinating phenomenon. That that's a challenge uh, to our understanding of the world. Yeah, uh, it is, so. and it's 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 so challenging. I guess is that people really don't know where to begin to study. And I think it really is best left to philosophers to maybe iron it out. Um, and then at some point further down the road, science can come in and, 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 and smooth out the, you know, the pavement so that we can come to mm-hmm. maybe a more clear picture. Um, but what I have noticed, and, and this is where I get into more of an esoteric slant on my work and i am absolutely an Mm -hmm. esotericist in in my approach towards all aspects of my ministerial work um Mm -hmm. what we do and what we have noticed and, and 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 this is somewhat empirical in the sense that i've been able to make these consistent observations um and those with me have been able to do the same and of course there has to be some type of theoretical conclusion because nothing's completely self-evident nothing's completely revealed it's always you're dealing with a lot of subjectivity so you're trying to make sometimes the best most educated guess that you can and then see if it works out but what we've noticed is that everything in reality or what we consider reality and the and, and and by reality in this context i'm saying our perception of it which is always filtered through the consciousness as you indicated mm-hmm. when we do this um what it seems to be is is being played out 
archetypally in this almost symbolic cosmic notation of the universe and universal cosmic alphabet if you will of all these archetypes that uh, you know Carl Jung did a very good job of breaking down mm. some of the primary ones the shadow the the trickster the you know the 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 wise old man the eternal child that kind of thing the great mother all these archetypes um and yet they transcend a culture they transcend uh, um time um, they've been with us going back to the earliest moments of of when writing things down. You see them in ancient stories, the same archetypes playing out. When you go to the movies, you're watching these same archetypes that have been with us for generations. Um, and mm -hmm. it seems almost as if these things, in fact, I wouldn't say almost, I would say absolutely. <laughs> it seems that this... <laughs> these archetypes are sentient and that a large part of what people consider to be spirits influencing them or interacting with them, whether it be adversely or in a positive way, whether it be some kind of uh, ecstatic vision like a saint or um, whether it be like a demonic attack that some people might feel, it always seems to come back to the same primary archetypes playing out roles is all as though it's a, a theater and you even mention this in your mm -hmm. book you even use that word theater um towards the end there mm -hmm. so i would like yeah. your I, i'd like your thoughts on that Where, have you looked at archetypes as maybe the building blocks of what we call reality as it pertains to the perceptions that we develop through consciousness have you have you looked at that at all Oh, I have, uh, Brian. I, I, I have uh, a, a, in my house a, uh, a whole bookcase full of Jung's books. Not that I have read them all carefully, but uh, and not that I am a, uh, I would count myself a Jungian, but I'm, a, I'm deeply uh, impressed by the psychology of Carl Jung. And I absolutely agree that uh, archetypes, uh, are, are realities that are, are interwoven with our experience. Uh, you left out one, by the way, which is the, that one of my favorites, the anima. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is, uh, you know, the uh, men who sometimes are enamored by women. I mean, this is a common everyday uh, illustration, uh, maybe, yeah, rather ordinary illustration, but the uh, the emotional reaction sometimes in in romantic relationships uh, transcend uh, the person uh, and in, entail some kind of contact with a an archetypal force that really uh, makes the experience so compelling and so fascinating and at the same time so dangerous. So I, I feel that uh, the uh, archetypal uh, figures uh, play a role uh, in our lives, but on the other hand, I have not gone into it that deeply, and, and and I've neglected actually. It's curious that you should be emphasizing Jung, uh, coincidental I should say, because I've been meaning to get back into Jung, and recently I've been stumbling on expressions and uh, ideas of his, uh, particularly with the more recent announcements from the government about the role of the reality of UFOs. You know, Jung wrote about uh, the archetypal nature of, of UFOs, somehow signaling the end of a civilization and the movement into a new one. So I, I do think that the, these are powerful forces and, uh, and do uh, engage with us in, in our lives. But I, I, I couldn't say much more uh, off the top of my head about um, about the archetypal dimension of our experience, which I can see you've thought about much more deeply than I have, uh, Brian. Well, it's been sort of the focus of my work. I was very much inspired in undergraduate school um, with Jung. And, mm -hmm. You know, his, his entire approach towards psychology made sense to me because one of the things that made me leave, I, I, my degree is not in religion, my degree is in psychology, um, but my, what made me transition over to a life in religion was that when I was in working in a clinical capacity, 
um, all I was doing is just pushing drugs on people. We weren't treating people. We were mm. maintaining people for mm. the benefit of society. We weren't really <laughs> curing anything. And um, right. I found that very problematic. And when I would really get into I always, I think, went a little bit above and beyond what was expected of me in my work because I really wanted to see these people that I was treating live better lives, not just simply maintaining them. Um, and what I noticed is that when I really started diving deep into their histories, I found that all of these issues came back to some type of spiritual causation. It, they didn't maybe not had that, they didn't maybe have the vocabulary to describe it that way. And they might not have even thought that that's what it was. But when you really break it down, it came back to some, some crisis in their perception of reality and their place within the universe in terms of how the mind relates meaning to everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt that at this point, I wanted to start talking to them more in a religious capacity, maybe not necessarily, maybe not so much religious, but spiritual capacity. And yet the mm -hmm. confines of my profession limited me to doing so, but you never worried about that. And perhaps that was because psychology was somewhat of a new thing that was being developed uh, at that time. And it wasn't the, the mm -hmm. trying to become this hardcore medical science like it is today. Um, where it's more behaviorist, right. it's, it's behaviorism today um, and cognitive, right. yeah, cognitive uh, psychology. We don't really get into psychoanalysis anymore. I mean, there's some that do, but they're not really as respected. Um, and it's hard to get even insurance sometimes to pay for one of those, you know, um, which shows you the direction that it's gone on a medical level. But I found that um, when you work with people at that archetypal level, you eventually start to see improvement and that's where i took my work in ministry and dealing with people that felt that they had demonic problems is that mm -hmm. you can talk to these archetypes so let's say you know you go in and you got somebody who says they're demonically possessed or oppressed and we go in and we determine that the whole family is being affected there's uh external uh phenomenon all happening um you know, phenomena happening all in the environment. Um, it's recordable. Mm -hmm. We can see it. We experience it. And when uh, the when you go in to do a blessing on this individual, they break down into full possession, and now this demon is talking to you. And we find that when we use the rules of that archetype, you know, and actually apply the the methods of the church to meet the expectation of that archetype, which, of course, is like the devil or Satan or Lucifer or whatever it identifies itself as, mm -hmm. then we can actually play out a story that resolves in a conclusion that ends up with a happy mm -hmm. ending. Um, and I found that very fascinating because it happened all the time. And that never happened when I was working in a clinical psychology. <laughs> so so uh, let me ask you a question. It sounds like it's a very interesting idea. It sounds like you're saying that when you confront the archetype, the diabolic archetype, rather than back away or try to destroy it, you, in a sense, you need to become, you need to communicate. You need to make friends, in a sense, with that uh, uh, alien and destructive force and thereby uh, attain, you know, the, the possibilities of... Um, of dealing with the suffering aspect of it and coming together in a, in a new state of, uh, of psychic harmony. Is that, that, is that what you were driving at? That's how I took what you just said, uh, and which I think is an interesting paradox and uh, a little uh, devilish itself to say that we have to make friends with the devil to overcome the devil. Well, it's 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 kind of radical, I think, in Christianity. Perhaps not so much in in Judaism, because I mean, when th there are ex exorcists in Judaism, a lot of people don't realize this. And Jewish exorcists, mm. you know, when they're working with uh, evil spirits like Dibix, for example, um, it's a negotiation mm. tactic. Is really how they mm -hmm. do it. They actually negotiate the spirit to move on mm. and and leave this person alone. It's not a mm -hmm. casting out. We in Christianity right. have turned the devil into a beast, this, this monstrous mm -hmm. beast. 
um, which is, I think, the most mm -hmm. extreme form of the shadow archetype. Um, and perhaps with a little hint of the trickster in there. It's always like a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And yet... Mm -hmm. Um, it was never really that way. And the devil in, in, in the Old Testament is a very different character than the one that we end up with in Christianity. And I, I mean, we mm -hmm. could go on for hours about why that happened and how that happened. But um, yes, mm -hmm. I would say to answer your question, I would say that that is an accurate way of, of, of placing it to the point that I would add just again and reiterate what I said earlier, that these things are truly independently sentient when dealing with them. Um, they are not mm. coming, they might be using the energy of the individual's mind, but they are coming from a different mm -hmm. arena altogether. And you see that when they're speaking ancient languages like Aramaic, that they, you know, you're talking about a person oh, yeah. with a GED speaking Aramaic, that, you know... <laughs> Right. Yeah. There are cases like that. And uh, Ian Stevenson uh, pointed out, he was a researcher in uh, reincarnation, that the, uh, the knowledge, xenoglossy as opposed to glossolalia, xenoglossy, the ability to speak responsibly in a language that you've never learned is an indication of an external sentient being operating uh, in that relationship, uh, to use your terminology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense to me. It's not my, uh, you, you just don't, uh, if, if a possessed person starts talking in a strange language, well, often it's Latin. Uh, and uh, yes, that's, that's definitely a suggestion of a full blown uh, living uh, archetypal sentient being that may be operating through this person. And so that is uh, makes a lot of sense to me. But but those cases, I'm sure you will agree with me, are relatively rare. Uh, from at least from my what I have read on the subject of uh, diabolism and and uh, reading some of the Christian writers in the field, uh, it, it is relatively rare. I mean, it's not not as common. Let's say not every poltergeist fits that uh that 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 model uh but uh yeah once in a while it turns up it does and and, and that and is correct it, it's not common at all um perhaps far more rare than people realize um and what we do see and this is kind of an extension i think of what we're already talking about what we do see as being a the most common explanation that we can come up with within the framework of our model okay which is of course going to conflict with i think what objective science might might say but in our model mm -hmm. you know we have four categories of demons that we look for and only one is classifiable as an actual genuine judeo-christian demon um you know the fallen angel motif that you mm -hmm. get and that would be perhaps the most extreme and that's the true possession typically but what we do end up seeing is other aspects and one category one of the four categories is what we call created and this falls into the occult concept of an egregore a thought form um, buddhists call it a topa yeah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is the single most common thing that we see and these projections extend out again, using the mind to create an external reality um, where a person mm -hmm. suffers trauma in some form or fashion, usually in childhood, that seems to go in one of two directions. Now, the common thing that we see is that people will internalize that trauma and then it becomes a repression that uh, gets buried and then causes them in later life, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, um, you name it, okay? Mm -hmm. Typically a miserable life going forward because they haven't been able to integrate the experience and yet there it is uh, torturing them. That would be something that mm -hmm. falls perfectly within the realm of conventional psychology where you go to the doctor is maybe a psychotherapist you go through years of therapy you maybe get on some medication to help and you know and sometimes it helps and a lot of times it doesn't then there's the other kind which is more rare but more what we see and this is when we get people that are coming to us and that's the externalization of trauma this is something you're not going to hear them talk about in in the psychological departments of the universities um and this is 
where instead of repressing it, what it what they do is the psyche seems to have the ability to externalize it, to get it completely outside of itself. But what it does is it comes out and it turns into this literal monkey on their back, this demon that is literally mm -hmm. attached to them and torturing them from the outside. And of course, they're mm -hmm. going to think that's Satan doing this. Um, they're going to think it's a, you know, some kind of denizen of hell. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, it coming mm -hmm. out and and attacking them. But what really it is is an extension of their own psyche that somehow got projected out. Because I've seen this in one of the right in the right of exorcism. Okay, one of the primary things that we do very early on in the right of exorcism is getting the demon's name. Because it is believed in ancient occult tradition going all the way back and that the church has accepted and adopted mm -hmm. this, that once you have the name of a demon, you have control over that demon. That's the first step to control. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of times when you're dealing with the fallen angel category, the first category I mentioned, you know, it'll say Lucifer, it'll say Saint Belizebub, whatever. Um, and yet, when we get this created sort, it will say things like lust. Or it, I've even I've even had a demon once call itself pedophilia. It will take on the name of whatever trauma they endured or suffered, and I found that that's really strange because there's no demon of pedophilia. There might be demons that might cause that temptation in the Judeo-Christian mindset and the worldview, but um, for a demon to refer to itself by that thing, I found odd. And I wanted to look further into that. And sure enough, you know, working with clients in this that had this particular thing happen, it, it was. They were victims of, of, of pedophilia early in life. They, they, it became, instead of a repression, an externalization. And yet this, they got this real sentient demon attacking them until we came in and removed it. Um, and that's just – that fascinates me because I think it goes along the lines of what you're sort of talking about – in, in in the powers of the mind and how the co consciousness is a lot more fluid than we realize and a lot more interactive with the external world than we realize. Or maybe the external world is a projection of the internal world and we just don't realize that. It's certainly Hinduism and Buddhism might agree. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, but I, it, it really, it begs the question, you know, what does that mean and what are the implications of that from a, a philosophical mm -hmm. standpoint? Because is the mind, you know, we can't reduce it down to simply, you know, we can't reduce consciousness down to simple brain matter. Um, yet, at some point, there seems to be an overwhelming awareness that seems inherent in all things. Um, and maybe the universe itself is aware to the degree that we could actually argue that... Um, the reason that we have awareness ourself is because we are the substance of the universe and the universe could not produce something that isn't already uh, a, a part of itself. I mean, we see that throughout reproduction. We see that throughout biology, all the science, all of science agrees that, you know, everything seems to, to pass on qualities or attributes of its parent, the parent nature into whatever offspring there is. So if the universe produced us and we know that it did and we know that we're, we were made up of the energy of stars, you know, um, why would mm -hmm. it be so hard to accept that the reason that we have consciousness is because that's a fundamental property of the cosmos and the, con the cosmos itself is fundamentally aware? That might be what God is. Well, I tend to agree with that, uh, and I, I gradually uh, arrived at the, uh, let's say I began with a view that I had my own personal mind, and I thought it was derived or produced by some way that I didn't understand by the brain, until I realized that there's no reason that we have to make the assumption that the consciousness, personal consciousness is produced by our brain, that we have other ways of looking at consciousness uh, and, the, and the relationship to the brain, namely that the brain is an organ that transmits consciousness, and that allows for the possibility of consciousness being in, in, entangled with our brains and bodies, but fundamentally independent of our brains and bodies. Now, once I got to that point, then I realized that my personal mind or my personal consciousness need not be viewed 
as an isolated entity, but on the contrary, uh, as the many philosophers and even quantum physicists have suggested, that all consciousness is one, numerically, that there is one mind and one consciousness. And of course, that's an idea that, that we find in all the great religions, uh, that there's one spirit, one God. Uh, the Upanishads uh, talk about the, 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 the divine consciousness, one consciousness. And that makes a whole lot of sense, a, a whole lot of sense to me, that uh, there is one underlying spirit consciousness that is behind, and the, uh, all of, each of our bodies and brains is a translation or an interpretation or a filtering of the one primordial mind, the one primordial consciousness. And that also explains the fact that, uh, or not the fact, that I would view it as a fact, that all the great religions are manifestations or interpretations uh, of one fundamental consciousness. But they all represent different phases of the experience of that one fundamental consciousness uh, throughout history. Today, you know, we have science to help us interpret uh, our the fundamental reality, which I believe is consciousness. The trouble is that we're not using the science objectively mm-hmm. in many ways and, uh, and being driven to deny the reality of consciousness. But so, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, and there was something else that I wanted to say about Jung as you were talking uh, James Hillman made a very interesting point once. The Hillman, of course, is great Jungian. Right. Uh, that person- personification, the points you were making about names are very important. The naming or the personification uh, of an agent is one way to connect the subconscious with the deeper realms of our minds. Now, sometimes we, uh, it, it, it may have a dark side. And we would therefore, in other words, will animate and, and tend to uh, coalesce our consciousness around some motif that is self-destructive. But the, the whole idea of naming the various aspects of our conscious potential life is very cru- uh, crucial and critical in terms of the, what we experience. Uh, if we have an idea, for example, some people have the idea that they have a, uh, a guardian angel. That's an old idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that belief, that readiness to, part, to personify that potential power within us becomes quite useful in terms of eliciting its hopefully beneficial powers and effects. We well, once you name talk. something, you give it life. Yeah, exactly. And so the naming is a very a, a crucial part uh, of um, it more intimate. Of our, yeah, right, right. It becomes more intimate and more alive, too. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, naming and the psyche are closely, and the dynamics of the psyche are closely related. So that's a very important point you've raised about names. Yeah, it's an old occult principle, and it definitely applies here religiously as well as psychologically. Even when we're looking at traditional therapy, um, being able to identify the causation or the point where there becomes a what I call a psychic fracture um, is essential to the healing process. It's only at the point where the uh, individual is able to recognize that do they then come to some point of healing. But we are talking right now with Dr. Michael Grosso, and we've got another half of the show to go. We're going to take a short break here, so don't go away. Um, And if you would like to call in, the number to call is 516-453-0138. Ask us a question. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be right back.
The seasons come and go like thoughts of you. Like a wave returns to the sea into the blue. They change, but in a cycle that I can lose. Each painful but delightful to live through. You came into my life just like another season. Not for long, just a time, just like another season. Maybe this time next year you'll reappear for no reason. But I'll cherish every day until you come my way this season.
Welcome back, everyone, to Vestiges After Dark. We're getting ready for the second half of the show. And, uh, well, taking your calls and your questions from the chat room, or but we prefer you call in. The, the number to call is 516-453-0138. That's 516-453-0138. The philo- philosophical conversation continues in just a moment. Don't, don't tune out. So much more to come. Welcome back, everyone, to the second half of Vestiges After Dark. My guest is Dr. Michael Grosso. We are talking about consciousness, archetypes, uh, how the paranormal relates to our experiences uh, with the non or incorporeal world, I guess you could say. And um, we were, uh, before the break, talking about uh, miracles, ghosts, and demons, but uh, we did touch on UFOs and um Dr. Gross, so I would be very fascinated to hear what you think about the UFOs, and it's particularly the immediate and kind of unexpected government disclosure that now they're acknowledging that there's been this kind of thing going right. on in the sky. Um, but also to the fact that there seems to be something a little bit intangible about them too, the way that they change shape, the behavior that they exhibit, um, defying physics, all of those kinds of things. It's difficult to capture a clear picture of them because they either are moving too fast or they're, they're morphing into different shapes or breaking into multiple lights and then combining into one large one. I mean, we've seen all sorts of interesting ways of the behavior. So I'm curious what you would think about that. Is that just another projection or archetype of human consciousness? Or do you think there's something more going on there? Well, first of all, uh, the UFO phenomenon uh, is very old. If, if, if you, there's an extensive and enormous literature on the subject. And I've been looking at it for many years because when I got my uh, PhD in philosophy at Columbia University. Just at the time that I did, I had a very strange UFO experience. I would call it a close encounter. Uh, and I uh, was with my girlfriend celebrating her birthday on the 23rd of April uh, in this beautiful spring evening, living in, both living in the Greenwich Village at that time. And something came out of the skies. And we were listening to John Coltrane's uh, music, The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost which may sound holy, but it was actually pretty wild jazz. <laughs> and I stepped... To the, yeah, old Coltrane, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. I, I stepped Selling in front of the... Uh, big pardon? Like you're telling on yourself, sir, talking about Coltrane. Yeah, oh yeah, Coltrane. So stuff. Uh, we stepped to the window and uh, just to look out, and uh, while the music was going, or I did at any rate, lights appeared... Uh, what I saw were lights dancing in the sky. Uh, it seemed in rhythm with the music. And for the first few seconds, I took it, oh, yeah, sure. And uh, then I realized what I was seeing was quite impossible. And I called Jane, my girlfriend, to the window. She saw the same thing. And they continued uh, for a few seconds to dance around. And then they shot south a few blocks to the dome of Our Lady of Pompeii, a Catholic church. In, the, in Greenwich Village, and beamed at us. And then from that oh. motionless position, where they were just lighting, the lights were going on and off, felt like they were connecting with us again, you know, the church, 
our Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost, music, all connected. And then they took off, and in the classic zigzag fashion of the UFO disappeared over the Empire State Building. Now, that was my experience, and uh, I don't know how Jane interpreted it. There was also a person on the roof. Uh, we went up the roof because we lived on the sixth floor, top floor, and it happened to be a guy up the roof that saw the same thing that we did. And this guy was someone we had just turned on to the music of John Coltrane. So this weird synchronicity was taking place. Hmm. But my interpretation of the experience was I had just gotten my Ph.D. in philosophy, and I was a doctor. And doctor, I believe in Latin, means wise. And I got the feeling that the message from whatever the heck it was out there that, was, that appeared to us was this. You're wise, Dr. Grosso? Figure this one out. <laughs> and I haven't been able to figure it out. And I do know that this is a widely reported phenomenon, and there's evidence that goes back to ancient Rome, uh, stories of lights that came out of the sky just the way they come out of the sky today. Nobody knows what is going on with these uh, phenomena. Uh, I have a 10-year separation of the various uh, books that have come out summarizing the latest research on the subject and invariably they always end up by saying we don't know what the hell's going on yeah. and what is going on is very complicated and very real and very at times dangerous and frightening if you know the whole literature or not the, I don't know the whole literature it's vast but I know enough to realize that whatever the heck it is out there that's playing around with us, we don't know why they're here, but we know that sometimes they are very, very nasty. Hmm. So you ask me what it means. I don't know. Uh, I have some theories. I, I think that parapsychology or psychical research and our understanding of the extraordinary human psychic abilities may help us understand this phenomenon. The UFO phenomenon is full of reports of communications from all kinds of strange entities via telepathy. Well, that's a subject matter yes, for yep. psychical research. And the other thing that it is full of is uh, stories of levitation. Now, I've written two books about levitation. Uh, mainly, Both books are about the, maybe the most famous uh, Catholic saint uh, known for his 35-year career as a priest in which he was constantly levitating, so much so that he couldn't perform his normal functions as a priest. J Joseph uh, Cupertino, only... right? Yes, yep. Joseph of Cupertino. And so the, the reality of the phenomenon is, is undoubted. Yeah, I myself conducted an experiment while I was a teacher in a university uh, with another professor it was a course in human potential, and we decided to do a ex uh, levitation experiment, which I didn't think was going to work and was going to result in nothing, but we did it. Why not? And it turned out that uh, we chose a 200-pound ex-marine as the subject to be lifted, and four young ladies just put their fingers on, their, on his elbows and under his knees. And we had been meditating together, so we had a kind of rapport as a class. And so I said, all right, let's chant a little and let's breathe in unison together with your fingers on, on this massive dude who was sitting in a chair, not expecting anything to happen. And when I said lift, he went up into the air. And mm -hmm. there were, I could see, and everyone could see, there was no effort. You cannot lift 200 pounds of, of a man into the air without making a some kind of a huge concerted effort. There was no effort. They were just touching him. Yeah. Up in the air he went. i never forget the look of astonishment on his face. <laughs> so I that that turned me on to the phenomenon of, uh, of levitation and got, got me into the research. So there's no question about the fact that this uh, uh, phenomenon is real. So I'm wondering if there are beings out there that are maybe a thousand or even a million years more evolved than we are. We already have the ability to do amazing things. Uh, uh, some individuals, some saints, some 
shamans can do extraordinary levitational things. Imagine a race of beings that have evolved that capacity to perhaps unlimited, uh, to uh, an unlimited degree. They might very well be able to do the kinds of things that we know uh, the, the UFO uh, phenomena seem to suggest uh, are possible. So uh, I don't know what's going on, but what seems to me happen, what we're witnessing with the UFOs are powers that completely transcend human, normal human abilities. Uh, we, we tempted to call it technology. So yes, maybe there are psychic te- technologies involved here, but who they are, it seems to me there are multitudes of different types of entities that are visiting this planet, multitudes, uh, all different kinds, some good and some not only bad, but murderously bad, mm-hmm. uh, particularly if you look at the, the literature on, on uh, UFOs in Brazil by Bob Pratt. Not only he's not the only one who wrote about it. Uh, about the murderous uh, phenomena of UFOs in Brazil. Others have also. Uh, People are driven crazy. They see things that completely shatter their nervous systems. Others, on the other hand, claim to be in contact with uh, intelligences that are looking to help the human race uh, survive its own destructive tendencies. So it may very well be that we're being visited by a multitude of strange and highly evolved entities uh, that may be spiritual, that may be physical, or may be combinations of both. We don't know. But the reality is there, and it's quite a fascinating time at this moment of our history that the United States government is finally owning up to the reality and admitting uh, that uh, these phenomena are, are, are real. And uh, the connections with parapsychology and psychical research and religion Uh, are exceedingly interesting uh, to look at. I'm particularly interested in the connection between UFOs and Marian visions. I'm sure you're aware of those connections. Oh, yes. Uh, Particularly the the, the Fatima event in 1917 uh, Mm -hmm. and this famous uh, game of the sun or the the alleged... uh, Well, the belief in the Catholic Church is that it was a miracle that involved some kind of sun manifestation yeah the miracle. sun dance they said the sun danced in the, the sky sun dance. of course the yeah. sun did not dance if the sun danced we'd be toast <laughs> would be the end of earth <laughs> but uh what what did happen was what what appears to have happened was that a ufo of transcendent technological abilities uh gave the appearance accompanying the three children who Apparently saw, but they alone saw a young girl who all she said in the beginning was, I'm from heaven. <laughs> she didn't say anything about the religious aspect of it. But the church, of course, turned that into a religious phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was a religious phenomenon, but was connected with some kind of amazing, baffling, super technology of, related to UFOs. And there are other examples in the history of religions where I know I can demonstrate the presence. Or, well, I don't know that I can demonstrate it. I think we can infer correctly that some kind of alien technology was involved. So that's a huge, huge question. And you've asked me that question at a moment of my own development when I happen to be really focusing on this. Because after I watched uh, uh, this, uh, it was about three weeks ago. 60 Minutes had this guy, uh, Elizondo, a, uh, a U.S. Uh, intelligence expert, owned up. Yeah, the guy the from ATIP. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so uh, it's, I find it extremely interesting. And I think what's happening is there are two things that are threatening uh, the existence of our entire planetary existence at the moment. One, of course, is the climate, uh, the growing climate crisis, and the other is the mounting uh, dangers of uh, uh, of war uh, and uh, of um, all over the all over the world. We've noticed the trends toward authoritarian governments and mm-hmm. the conflicts that they uh, uh, promise to uh, to produce if the process continues. So. 
And moreover, we're getting into, uh, on the verge of getting into an arms race with China and Russia again. So it's a very, very dangerous moment in the history of life on this planet. I believe the entire planet is uh, in danger. And uh, the U may be part of an attempt to deal with that, but they may also be part of the problem itself. I don't know, but it's a very exciting and dangerous moment in human history, as far as I can see. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, anyway, I th- that's my, my quick reply. My yeah. Reply to your big question uh, about you folks. No, it's fa- fantastic. And uh, honestly, I, I, I think there's no accident that this sort of disclosure is happening around the time of the COVID 19 pandemic and the government reactions but- that have been unlike anything we have seen in any point mm-hmm. in history. So. Some connection there. I'm calling in from the 608 area code in Wisconsin. Hello, you're on the air. Hello, Wisconsin. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. Yes, do you have a question? Hi, I'm... Yeah, I have a question. I I, I had this in the the chat some time ago, and my, my question is... When you hear a voice in your dream, perhaps your own voice, you know, can that be your own voice or maybe something else impersonating your own voice? I'm thinking about, you know, my house dream that I had, a, you know, kind of, you know, kind of from late May uh, that, I, that I posted about in the, in the whole, the you know, social network. Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of weeks ago, mm. and just think I'm, you know, if you know, if in the dream it was my voice or maybe something else. So you're mm. asking if if uh. some external consciousness could uh, use your own voice to speak to you inside your mind. I guess there's some type of telepathy. W- what do you what do you think about that, um, Doctor Grosso? Well, it depends on the context and what you heard. You're just hearing a voice by itself uh, is, uh, especially if you're asleep uh, or near sleep, could easily be construed as a, uh, a subjective manifestation. But it depends on what the voice says and how, if it repeats itself, if it's constant, if it becomes obsessive. In other words, there's... Uh, how long, how frequently has this happened to you? Uh, is it just once? If it happened only one one time, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's happening on a regular basis, and if it's saying things that are distressing, in it, uh, then 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 I would consider the possibility that something paranormal is going on. Yeah, that, that would be my. Because in my dream, it kind of was like was like like, a, like like an echoey, like coming from another dimension kind of voice. Uh huh. Right. And it was it was, it was, but, but, it was just but that how one often time has in my this happened? Yeah, I'm asking you, how often has it happened to you? So far, just once in my dream, it was just repeating the same uh-huh. thing. You know, help me, get me ah. out of here, like repeatedly, and it sounded like it, was, it sounded like my own voice. Huh. Yeah. Well, what do you think it is? Well, the right now, I, mean, I, know, was, was, I know you're perplexed, but 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 what is your first take on it? Well, I think I, you know, at first in the dream, I kind of, you know, I, I heard the voice, but I couldn't make out who it was or what it was saying. But later on, in the voice, uh, later on in the dream, I, as I was walking down the hallway, it, it was like louder and finally made it out as my own voice. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit strange, but uh, I, I, w- I wouldn't worry about it unless it can, it was a con- fairly continuous or recurrent phenomenon. Uh, uh, odd things happen <laughs> to people that are quite harmless, but strange. Uh, I, I had a weird experience recently. I woke up in the morning and, uh, as I was, um, Getting out of bed, I felt a force grab my hands and pull the sheet up. And I suddenly got the idea 
had to go downstairs into the basement and put the sheets in the uh, in the laundry and clean them. Now I normally would never do that, but I something grabbed me and sent me downstairs. And I rarely go downstairs unless there's a problem. And I went downstairs, and there was a flood. The water had overflowed the sink. I had no idea that my entire basement was being flooded. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah. I assumed that my unconscious telepathically tuned in, not telepathically, clairvoyantly tuned in with what was happening downstairs and conveyed that message to me. And so that I did something that I would never do, uh, rush down and do laundry in the, in the morning when I'm waking up. I never do that. Uh, so uh, it was strange, uh, yeah. but it was helpful, and I assumed that this was simply my own subconscious clairvoyance doing me a favor, and I said thank you. Uh, but uh, weird things do happen, and sometimes when you don't understand, it could seem frightening. Uh, and uh, But above all, don't be frightened. Even if it is uh, something that you can't quite understand, uh, recognize that it's uh, you can deal with it. Yeah, I think that's really. Uh, and if it wants, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That, that's... No, that, 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 that's all I would have to say. What do you think, Brian? No, that's good advice. I mean, that's. I think we have a tendency, perhaps, when we have a paranormal experience, to have a fear reaction. I think it's natural because it's out of our realm of normal experience, and that's kind of the fight or flight reaction that we are kind of programmed into our DNA to keep our survival at its you know, uh, peak mm -hmm. efficiency. And uh, so naturally things right. that are not familiar are going to invoke usually some kind of fear reaction in most people. And, and I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's important to kind of take a step back and realize that most of this that we call paranormal is not malevolent. Um, at best, it's probably neutral. Um, and right. yeah. And so I think that's good advice. Um, fantastic. Calling in from the nine, seven, nine area code in Texas. Hello. You're on the air. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Yes. This is also kind yeah. of about voices, but it is a weird thing that happened to me several years ago. I was going to help do voter registration and we were in the middle of a drought and no rain predicted at all. And I didn't want to park really far away from the school I was going to. So I thought, well, I'll park in a field. And there were literally cracks in the ground big enough you could throw quarters down sideways. And as I was putting the car in park, I heard a, an audible voice saying, you're parked in the mud. And I'm like, no, I was by myself. And I heard it again, you're parked in the mud. And I said, okay, okay, I'm parked in the mud. And I left, and I, as soon as I got in there and set my table up, the thunder shook the building, and there was, like, an incredible rain that was not predicted. And at 10 o'clock at night, I was getting tow chains out at Walmart. So how do we huh. explain something like that? Wow. Uh -huh. yeah, I think well, it's similar that... to a Adria's uh, experience, yes, yes. where your subconscious yes. is trying to reach out to you to either warn you about something or draw your attention to something. Yeah, I would okay. say the same. That was that was a benign. Uh, that was a, that was your guardian angel, <laughs> mm. uh, uh, <laughs> giving you a little bit of uh, assistance there. Yeah, has that stuff like that happened to you other times, or is that the only time that you can oh, recall yeah. something like? That? No, no, it it happens. Not, I wouldn't say frequently, but you know, I've got a lot more stories than that one. So. Okay, so that that means you're 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 in, you're in tune, tune with your yeah uh, with something there going on and uh, yeah that that's an interesting story. It reminds me of the story that uh, of Socrates, by the way. Socrates, who's known to be the founder of, of rational thinking, also had a daimon, not a demon, but the Greek word daimon, which was an inner voice that uh, would warn him. It would only, it never told him anything positive. It would tell him not to do things. And there's a famous story that he got an impression that his pals, who were having a conversation, and they were going home, they were planning to leave and go on a walk on a, on a certain path. And he said, I just got a message from my 
daimon, and you guys better go by a different path because you're going to be attacked by a bunch of wild pigs. Mm. Uh, and sure enough, it, it happened. It's a story that's recorded. I've forgotten if it's in Plato or Xenophon. But so Socrates would get these little warnings like that. Uh, and uh, incidentally, it's interesting about Socrates. On the morning that he went to trial, uh, when, he, when they were going to condemn him to death, he did not get a message from his inner daimon, and he assumed that no matter what happened, even if they judged him guilty and sentenced him to death, he was perfectly all right. And that's what happened. And uh, he, it's a very interesting story about the absence of his daimon warning him, told him that dying would be perfectly okay, and he went to his death with uh, philosophical serenity. I don't know what happened after that, however. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that uh, contribution. That's an interesting thing. And just pay attention to it. I'd say, you know, uh, make note of so all of these occurrences it, and see if there's so a is theme. That like, is that like your gut or is that like a guardian angel? I mean, I know he had mentioned that, but I'm just curious what y'all think that really is other than inner voice. <laughs> well, I would say... Uh, we're connected at a level, again, going back to the first half of the show, when we're talking about the fundamental properties of awareness, which I believe are inherent within the cosmos itself. I mean, I really think that that's where we get it, is that the cosmos itself is consciousness or awareness to a certain degree, and that we are ex uh, uh, emanations of that primary fundamental consciousness or awareness. I, I Probably awareness is the better term. And, and so, you know, I would say that some of us, those like yourself, are super connected to it. And so those things that we come up with metaphors or, or parables or even an archetypal story like a guardian angel um, is, is, a, is an expression of that, a way of uh, using a religious paradigm in order to explain something that is largely... Uh, outside of normal experience. And so what we're really dealing with, though, is, is, is an interconnectedness at a level that, you know, the ancient world wouldn't have been as, uh, had the same terminology that we do today, because we're looking at it from a very different vantage point than they would have. And they were more spiritual naturally, where we're more disconnected. But we're also coming at it from a different direction, because we're, we've been raised to be materialists essentially i mean that's our education system is based on materialism so uh, that kind of disconnects us a little bit from where our ancient right. our ancient ancestors would have been but i think it's all the same thing so it really doesn't really matter if it's your gut or a guardian angel or some kind of property of the universe that's reaching out to aid you i think it's all coming from the exact same thing it's all different names for the same thing that's how i would view it my my well that's exactly okay. Yeah, I would agree with that, that it's fundamentally, uh, I, I just use the expression guardian angel because it's a colorful way to personify what seems to be a, a power of the subconscious mind, which only occasionally acts up on our behalf. Uh, and, I, I, and I sometimes wonder if we to go back to our discussion of language, if a person, let's say, believed in a religious system that is allowed the concept of guardian angel, and that and one spoke to one's guardian angel on a right, regular basis, engaged with it, that that might increase the possibilities of, of uh, deploying that subconscious mysterious ability by naming it and then relating to it consciously in a in a way that encourages its. Uh, its reality affirms its reality. Uh, but again, I don't know that there's any evidence to prove that, what I just said, but it's, it does make sense to me that that's that the way it may work, something like that at any rate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think, well, thank you. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you for calling in. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is uh, Father Chris from Australia. Am I correct? Are you on the air? Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, hey, we can hear you just fine. Hello. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, I, I wanted to say something about um, perception, actually. Um, but, I mean, you, you, 
uh, as is often the case, uh, you thought about these things very deeply, and, and uh, you and Michael were both um, drawing a, a kind of similar inference to what I wanted to say, which is that, you know, because of our age, this rationalist age that we live in, um, perception has sort of played a, a second fiddle, you know. I mean, unless something can be sort of uh, rationally, empirically examined, we dismiss it. And therefore, our mindset has shifted to that. And so, uh, whereas actually, we perceive all sorts of things. I mean, again, I, I, I refer back to it all the time, but when I trained for the police, we'd, we're taught, you know, you don't just... It's not somehow... Um, somehow you know when someone's going to attack you. Um, yes, you do. Somehow you know, yeah, and the somehow you know is actually all sorts of things that we have perceived that hasn't passed through our rational or frontal cortex, if you like, that, that there are there are things that we are aware of that we're not even aware of, <laughs> which yeah. is a very philosophical statement to make, of course. Uh, and, and so I think I think what, what I've heard people tapping into, uh, I, I, and things like um, the predicting the flood, uh, that made me think of an Aboriginal community here in Australia, who I know very well, um, who think nothing of saying, oh, there's going to be heavy rain coming, even though there's no, mm. there's no meteorology that suggests that. They just know. Mm. And, and, it, mm. and it's because their culture hasn't closed off this idea that perception is more than simply the sort of materialism that, we, that we've you know, been fooled to believe in in the West. Yeah, and that's na- what nature will tell you because... if you if you know how to listen. Yeah, and I, I, well, I think that this divide that's been that's been placed between the spiritual and the actual, which I think this discussion and what we've been saying today is that's a false division. We don't believe in that division actually, um, and so part of I think the mission of of this of this channel and of, and of what you do, Bishop Brian, is, is to is to say no. There's not a boundary between these two things. Um, they're the same thing, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's why I'm interested, Michael, in your in your reference to language. How we how we give names to these things. I mean, I mean, I'm quite obviously quite happy with the idea of a guardian angel because I'm a Catholic priest. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it really doesn't matter what we call it. Uh, but but I think that if we could, uh, what, what I would like to encourage in people is is to be more intuitive, more perceptive, or, to, or rather to feed those sides of ourselves. Because I think that the hyper-rationalist side has been, is overfed, it's obese mm-hmm. in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, what, and what we need is to feed that kind of perceptive, intuitive side uh, and not see it as, uh, I mean, uh, technically the esoteric is the right word. I'm not, I'm not arguing <laughs> with that. But, um, but not to see it as esoteric in the pejorative sense, but actually a perfectly sensible way to live your life uh, and that's why the use of archetypes is, is so essential as Michael began the show by talking about um, so uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, my, my, um, yeah my, my feedback is to say that uh, we perceive more than we can possibly know uh, and it's good to spend so I think that's what prayer, meditative prayer contemplative prayer is about uh, is about um, you know and enc- encouraging ourselves to place ourselves uh in the how how am i perceiving how am i perceived you know um yeah. yes. I, yes. I think that's the, per- the great the great mystics are involved in that in, in, in the, they show us the way agreed uh, i i couldn't agree with you more that uh, that we do that we undoubtedly perceive at some level a whole lot more than we're conscious of and the trick is to Tune in to that, uh, to trust. You know, there's uh, parapsychologists tell us, of course, and this fits most religious uh, belief systems, that belief or expectation is one of the predictor variables for people who do well with ESP. Folks who have uh, no confidence whatsoever, who are inherently or habitually skeptical and doubting, tend automatically to cut themselves off from noticing the things that they know that they don't know, <laughs> to, to use your paradoxical <laughs> phrasing. So that, that, that is something that we can work on. Uh, once we realize that there are solid grounds for whatever, you know, scientific or religious or experiential, for our capacities, our deeper nature, that we need to encourage us ourselves 
And that maybe is what, you know, uh, prayer is all about and ritual is all about and fasting is all about and all of the practices associated with religiosity and uh, and some forms of even some forms of philosophical spirituality. But we have to take a more active stance toward our own capacities. And uh, if we believe that certain things are possible, I have a feeling that it, it increases the likelihood that we will actually experience them. So uh, this seems like. Uh, well, it, it, do you think it? Do you, do you think it also makes us better people? I mean, I, I mean, in as much as, how can you be a poet or a playwright if you didn't have hmm. those kind of perceptions? You know, it, I mean, it, we've seen yeah. the sort of. It, it, this is why this idea of a top-down, you know, I mean, I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but because I'm, I'm not, this isn't the, the argument I'm trying to fight. But you know, the Oscars committee, for example, uh, said, well, you have to have, you know, this many black actors, this, you know, whatever it may be. There's a, a kind of formula that says, in order to qualify for an award, you've got to tick so many boxes. But that is mm. fundamentally opposed to the creative act. Because mm-hmm. uh, the creative act is about perceiving and being perceived and, and expression. And actually, the, in a, the more rational rule you, you, you place a priori to that, the less likely you're going to get any kind of creative output that anybody is going to resonate with because it's, because it's artificial rather than... Because uh, I do think what makes people resonate is when you perce- perceive something that actually everybody perceives and they can't put their finger on it. You know, and that's the gift of the poet, of, of the writer, of, of, of the creative person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I agree with that completely. Uh, th- th- thank you for saying that so eloquently. Yes, indeed. I, I think I would say that beauty, our concept, our notions of beauty, uh, as expressed through art, whether that art be music or theater, or actual, you know, the, the material arts, of painting and, and um, you know, the fine arts and sculpture, perhaps, mm-hmm. um, are the best tangible proof of God that I think we have. Because from an evolutionary perspective, if you're just being purely materialistic, that makes no sense. <laughs> we don't need a concept of art. Maybe you could say beauty has something to do with uh, sexual... Um, compatibility and 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 you know a cute mm-hmm. child is something that you might be more inclined on an evolutionary scale to care for rather than something that's ugly and grotesque so you might say that beauty serves some kind of survival purpose in that respect but you know when you start getting into this fundamental need within the human being to create things um that's not, that's operating at a much higher much different level than survival it's operating a much different level than just the mere biological instinct to uh, continue um so i think that that's where we need to begin our search at least as far as science is concerned or materialism or tangibility i think that's where it needs to start is looking at art and beauty our notions of oh, these things and, and, and- and beauty, I mean, the whole point about beauty is it, it, it's very different from prettiness. Yes. Uh, I mean, we could talk about the golden ratio and, you know, the kind of, in a sense, the scientific attempt to explain beauty, and it always falls short. Because, I, I mean, I was, I was listening to a, pod, a, a podcast today talking about auto tune in the music industry and how it's destroying harmony. Because actually, harmony <clears> sounds bigger and richer when there's imperfections, when they're, they're out by a hundredth of tone. You know, and so, and actually, when it's made perfect, it it doesn't sound real. It sounds artificial, and and it sounds smaller. You know that actually mm-hmm. part of beauty is is the flaw. You know, because beauty it, beauty has to have a kind of um, measure against which it's measured. You know, and and the flaw is that measure, and and therefore mm-hmm. the flaw is part of beauty. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I I would throw into this conversation not only beauty but uh, truth. Uh, these are abstract things. Morality. Uh, I mean, Wisdom. if we are strictly if we are right. strict materialists, uh, well, these abstract things have no meaning. What does truth mean? Who cares about truth, right? Well, let's yeah. just say what we want to get our way. Uh, who cares about justice? Uh, I mean, justice is abstract. It's intangible. All these things are quite intangible 
Uh, that is to say, they're not physical in any obvious sense of the word. I mean, there are physical manifestations of injustice. But, but uh, see, truth the, and justice you know, are things that we inherently want. There's some seed within us that all of us want truth, all of us want what's right. There's just something within us that tells us that's the right thing to do. I so, would say most of us, not all of us. <laughs> well, true. There are people that are but, but, but even, <laughs> even an evil person, but, but even an evil person uh, believes in truth. Knows they're evil. Believes in justice. Mm-hmm. They have to, and and because only then can they engage in a in a battle against it. Right. You, you can't <laughs> fight that which you don't believe. <laughs> so I'm not even, sure, even I'm not sure, own... I was going to say I'm not sure if that applies to Donald Trump or his followers, but I shouldn't say that. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some people that seem completely devoid of any sense of truth or any sense of high values, and uh, I think they can uh, be sort of uh, twisted out of their humanness, and that's pretty sad and pretty dangerous when it happens. But um, yeah, I mean, it's there. There's, I think, a, I think there is absolutely a flaw within human nature somewhere. And of course, religion has tried to deal with the problem of evil in multiple ways. You know, uh, Buddhism links it back, of uh-huh. course, to um, uh, attachment to impermanence. You know, we, we we live in a world of entropy, and impermanence is all around us. And the way that the psyche deals with uh, a, a scarcity is by squandering it, and that creates the seeds of evil behavior. And then you have in Christianity, uh, you know, the whole mythos of Adam and Eve, the original sin, which gives us again another yeah. sort of explanation of these ineffable things that occur on some higher level that perhaps are well outside of normal, you know, the normal capacity of the human intellect to understand. And and um, but, but but that's that's why the attack on that, that, that's why the attack on on the uh, on the canon, if you like, on 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 the on the mythos that we've received through the ages, is such an attack uh, because um, the things that we can, the way that we discern those eternal principles of truth and justice and you know those love the things that we've mentioned is to look for what has been consistently identified with those things throughout all known human existence. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's the purpose of the canon. And, and that's why, you know, it's not just an attack on, it's not a political attack that's going on at the moment in terms of wanting to, you know, wipe away all of those things, not have them taught in schools or universities, not debate these things. It, it, it's, mm. it, it's actually a dehumanizing attack on the, the very principle of truth uh, and trying to, you know, cut off an, um, you know, when you mention people that aren't critical, that can't think critically, or, or that, or that um, are perhaps ideologically possessed in a way that you think is destructive, just, um, a destructive manner, it's because they, they've been separated from um, these revelations that have happened throughout human history. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why it's so important to, you know, no matter whether we agree with a, with a certain religious viewpoint or not, it's important to, un, to, to know that human beings have had these conversations, that, that you know that Socrates, you know, the circumstances around him drinking the hemlock juice, you know, we, we have to know these stories. This is the canonicity of, of, of human life, and, and it's, why, it's why it's so important to do these things. I think it comes back to what we started the conversation out with and this understanding of what reality is and how far we can take it. Does it become an act of solipsism in, in the end, or is there some kind of fundamental actuality in which we are all trying to connect? I mean, is it subjective to the point that whatever we want or whatever we believe is truth, or, or is there something higher that is absolute? Um, you know, that's, I think the balance between the absolute and the conventional are always going to be the struggle of the human being, and perhaps that is part of the meaning of life, and though I would say the meaning of life is quite simply to simply say, uh, the meaning of life is the ability to ask the question. <laughs> I would say that that's all it needs to be. But at the same time, I think, you know, there might be certain functions within. And I mean, certainly Dr. Grosso's book deals with that. All of this is leading to perhaps some next stage of evolution. So maybe perhaps whatever comes next after Homo sapien. I like to call that 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 
homo completenda, but maybe there's going to be other stages between homo completenda and homo sapien. I don't know. Um, but it's definitely leading towards something. Uh, you know, Dr. Gross, I'd like to ask you not to not to change the subject. It's kind of on the same wavelength, though. Um, have sure. you done any research in uh, DMT and the experiences that people have where they, you know, they use it one time? Um, which is mm -hmm. in the United States an illegal substance at the present time, um, but you know it's oh, been yeah. it's an ancient it's an ancient uh, chemical that's been used in ritual going back thousands of years, and it's been reported mm -hmm. by m many people that when they try it for the first time, they a lot of them describe it as a life changing experience that it's it's like a mm -hmm. a god drug i mean it in connects them in ways some people don't have though pleasant ones there are mm -hmm. horrifying experiences that can happen too so have you done any research yeah. on that uh well research uh, i remember uh, uh meeting uh, terence mckenna we were both giving talks at a conference and he said the first thing he said to me let's go upstairs and do some dmt i said are you crazy you want me to be, do dmt before i'm about to give a lecture but no I, I have not i have not done D, dmt but i have done uh, uh acid uh, lysergic acid uh, mushrooms uh marijuana uh and and, and uh, uh, mescaline but i haven't gotten to dmt yet but uh, I, I have no doubt about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the, the Eleusinian mystery, which was a 2,000-year-old Greek cult, culminated in the ingestion of a kukion, meaning a brew, that consisted of something like LSD and beer. So the, the world is quite familiar, and, and cultures throughout history are familiar with the use of psychoactive chemicals. And I've been uh, very much involved in exploring. Uh, my research is my experiments. I mean, of course, I read about the subject, too. But there's no doubt about the fact that uh, 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 these chemicals uh, can uh, alter our perception of reality and change and transform our whole uh, metaphysical outlook. And uh, I can't really say that any one particular uh, item or trip or experience that I've had has been a, a decisive transformer of my experience. I've been transformed more by the, the paranormal experiences I've had, but the, uh, the psychedelic is, is, a, is a, a useful and a powerful agent uh, for exploring consciousness. And uh, fortunately, right now, the, the, there's a change uh, in the, as a matter of fact, in a couple of days, it's going to become legal in this in the state of Virginia, where I live right now, uh, to smoke weed. Uh, and I think that's a step toward the evolution of consciousness. It's no longer treated as a criminal, I mean, criminal offense. Uh, I remember back in the 60s when I was a young student seeing a movie uh, about marijuana, uh, which represented it represented it as a some kind of it will drive you completely crazy it'll turn you into a mad killer and it was a joke <laughs> yeah because everybody knew that it was the complete opposite it it, it uh so we're, we're at a good time in, in history uh to confront uh the the utility and the potential of of how we can begin to change our consciousness in ways that are very effective and very very powerful so uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm gung ho for the use of uh, uh, of these uh, substances, the wise and careful uh, use of them. Well, they definitely should be but, studied uh, further, and 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 certainly, you know, DMT. I believe, if I understand it correctly, is produced in the pineal gland naturally. So we already have. I <laughs> guess you could mm -hmm. say the receptors to use this chemical, perhaps not to the degree. Uh, of what you know taking it in ingested or smoking form uh, would give but certainly the, pr the the propensities there within us and i think there's definitely connection there but you know father uh, um father chris uh, sister mary joan dr grossa we are at the end of the show and i just want to say thank you all oh, wow. Yeah, it goes so quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> we, we need to carry yeah. this on over a glass of whiskey. I, <laughs> we yeah, do. I a good scotch. Conversation. I, I ended up being mostly a listener tonight. It was fascinating. I, I appreciate you uh, coming on, Dr. Grasso. 
All right. Thank, Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. I mean, talking about this subject is, uh, is a good way to end it. It is. You know, I, I would love to invite you back on at some point in the future, Dr. Grosso, if you'll have us. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I enjoyed meeting you all. Thank you again. Uh, take care, sir. Thank you. Take care, everyone. I thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you found the conversation as fascinating as I did. Um, I, I, I'm just blown away. You know, it was just great, great two hours. Um, next week, we have uh, Darren Evans, demonologist. Uh, he will be uh, talking about uh, recent encounters with Zozo. Um, so don't miss that, okay? Uh, that'll be next week at, uh, um, at the normal time, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Take care. God bless.